So let's talk about the end of the war. The end of April, as Hitler realizes that on both sides, armies are coming closer and closer to Berlin, he decides to commit suicide. He, um, many of the Nazi leaders did that. Rather than being captured and, and uh, prosecuted for their massive war crimes, they kill themselves. So then the Nazi generals are left to decide what to do, and they decide to surrender very wisely. So that officially takes place on May 8, 1945. So that is called Victory in Europe, or VE Day. And there was widespread relief, celebrations. Um, in particular, in Britain, these communities that have been under the threat of war for nearly six years, extreme rationing, everyone pulls together their supplies and their resources to throw a big party. This is such a relief. The thing is, the war isn't entirely over yet. There still is the war in the Pacific. Now, if we look at the map, this map is from 1939. So much of what happens in the Pacific starts off as leftover tension from the colonial era. We have Australia and New Zealand, which are technically British. Then we have these in yellow territories controlled by Great Britain, including Ireland and India and sort of Thailand. Then there's the Dutch. And look at how much the Japanese have. Remember, we, we've talked about the Japanese wanting to extend a sphere of influence to prove that they are the most powerful in their neighborhood. And this is the result of the Meiji era being forced to open to the West. Um, some of the island groups they received after World War I, like the Caroline Marianas and um, Marshall Islands. Um, Japan had done this, uh, taken much of this territory, especially on the mainland of Korea, Manchuria, and China. Um, they'd been very aggressive in doing this. And so this makes everyone else in the neighborhood a little bit nervous. They're nervous about their colonies. Even America has the Philippines. They're nervous about this Japanese aggression. Um, many, many important battles, but since this is a European class, we're just going to very quickly go over some of the, the big ones. We've got the Battle of Midway, which is midway between the U.S. and Japan. And because the Pacific Ocean is so vast, it was important to control these islands. So whoever could control midway would have a refueling station, could have um, an airfield from which to conduct further battles. So the Allies win this, and it's a pretty big turning point. The general tactic that will be used in the Pacific is called island hopping. The Allies want to reclaim this whole corridor of islands from the Japanese. And rather than fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, they decided to use air power to take back, to have sort of these bombing campaigns to force the Japanese to retreat. General Twining rejoined our theater commander, General Millard Harmon, in planning new operations up the Solomon Island chain. We had fresh B-24s, and in July, we were able to launch our 37-day campaign to Jap-held Munda Field on New Georgia Island. Some of us had taken off from hard-won Henderson Field on Guadalcanal, which American men had bought and paid for with their lives. The blow we were about to deliver to Munda, we hoped, would make their sacrifices worthwhile. We were finally nearing the island. As soon as we made our approaches to Munda, Jungle hopping medium bombers went after the Jap Air Drum and its defenses. Then our liberators opened up. the enemy held on until 171 aircraft dropped 145 tons of bombs in a half hour. It was the heaviest air bombardment yet cooked up in the South Pacific in one day. By the time resistance had ended, the enemy had lost 350 aircraft. In only nine days, the Allies rushed the strip into operating condition. 
P-40s were the first to land, followed by heavy bombers which could easily be carried on the coral runways. Warhawks helped protect the base as we rapidly built it into a key for the Solomon Islands. In a few weeks, traffic exceeded that of any field in the South Pacific, reaching the peak of 564 aircraft in one day. The Munda campaign had shown the success of a new tactic, bypassing heavily defended enemy points and gaining air superiority behind them. General MacArthur described the island hopping campaign as a series of battles for airfields. In the South Pacific, as elsewhere in all global operations, the Allies had proved the might of air power. Air power had helped clear submarines from the Atlantic. Air power had conquered the hump. Air power had made Pacific island hopping possible. Another reason why um, the Allies didn't necessarily want to fight hand to hand was they wanted to limit the number of prisoners of war who were taken by the Japanese. The Japanese uh, treated their prisoners abominably. They would send them on forced marches, use them as forced labor, and all of this in this really harsh, hot, humid climate. Uh, here we have a fo famous photograph of an Australian officer about to be beheaded by a samurai sword. And this is part of the reason why the Japanese were such a difficult foe. By this point in the war, by, by spring 1945, the Japanese are the only ones left from their allies. The Germans and the Italians are out of the war, so the Japanese are all that's left. And they refuse to give up, and this really comes from that sort of samurai Bushido tradition, that you fight to the last, you fight for your honor. We see this at Iwo Jima. Um, Iwo Jima was a volcanic island, and the Japanese had dug series of caves all throughout. They were willing to hold on to that island. It wasn't that they needed to farm or anything, but it was the proximity to Japan that it could be used as an airfield to then launch bombing campaigns over Japan. Again, using that fight to the last mentality. And the Allies just are exhausted. They have risked so many men, so many lives at Iwo Jima. Um, by this point in the war, it was very common for, for journalists to be traveling uh, to send back information of what's going on. And he wanted to capture the American success and victory on, uh, on the island of Iwo Jima. The tallest point was Mount Suribachi. So he, this was the photo he wanted to get. And when he was testing his camera, this was another photo he took. This becomes the famous photo and the inspiration for the Iwo Jima Memorial in Arlington, Virginia. So the Pacific campaign, the Pacific theater in general, very, very costly. Um, and the British and Americans have to decide, are they willing to continue fighting this war at, if the costs are going to continue in the same fashion? They decide they aren't, which is why it was so important to use the atomic bomb. This had been developed over a number of years by the Manhattan Project. And um, there were a few tests that were done using this weapon. These were the only instances where nuclear weapons were used as a wartime measure. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be learning more about the atomic bombings in Japan during World War II. In the early days of the Second World War, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the United States government were warned by noted scientific minds Albert Einstein and Leo Szilard of the possibility that Nazi Germany might attempt to develop nuclear weapons. After being urged to undertake their own research, the US, UK and Canada approved the Manhattan Project in late 1941. By 1943, development and research on nuclear bombs by the Manhattan Project began in earnest. Several concepts for these atomic weapons were explored, but finally two were chosen. The first was codenamed Little Boy. This bomb used uranium as its weapon and was propelled using the gun method. The Little Boy was not tested prior to being used as a weapon in World War II. Next came the Fat Man Bomb. Its nuclear explosion was caused by plutonium, and as opposed to the little boy, the fat man's detonation was caused by an implosion. This device was tested prior to its use in warfare. On July 16, 1945, the gadget was successfully tested in the New Mexico desert. This explosion resulted in a bright flash of light and heat, followed by a shock wave and a mushroom cloud that rose 40,000 feet. This event is credited with ushering in the atomic age. 
The United States and the Allies then had nuclear weapons at their disposal and planned to use them in an effort to end the war. Just a few months prior to the bomb's test, on May 8th, the Germans unconditionally surrendered. Because of this, Japan became the next likely target, and several Japanese cities were then proposed. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were finally chosen as the most strategic bombing locations due to their importance in the war effort. On July 26, 1945, representatives of the US, UK and Chinese nationalist governments issued the Potsdam Declaration to the Japanese. This document ordered the Japanese to immediately surrender or they would face prompt and utter destruction. The Japanese government chose to ignore these extreme demands and made it clear to the Japanese public that the government would not acquiesce. And so, on August 6, 1945, in an effort to quickly resolve the war, the little boy bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan by the Enola Gay bomber at 8.15 a.m. local time. The bomb exploded above the city and caused the destruction of roughly five square miles of land. Not only that, but 70,000 people were injured and 70 to 80,000 more were instantly killed. Japan remained steadfast in their refusal to bow to pressure. Three days after the Hiroshima bombing, the country was still attempting relief efforts when the boxcar bomber dropped the Fat Man bomb on Nagasaki at 11.01 a.m. on August 9th. The bomb missed its intended target, but the explosion above Nagasaki killed between 40 and 75,000 people instantly. While burns and radiation poisoning were immediate health problems caused by the bombs, the effects of both explosions were felt for years to come. Cancers and other diseases plagued the population in the decades following the attacks. The American government prepared for the possibility of further nuclear attacks on Japan. However, it was unnecessary. On August 14th or 15th local time, Japan finally surrendered. When the surrender documents were finally signed on September 2, 1945, the war was effectively over. They dropped the first bomb over Hiroshima, and the Americans are hoping, the British are hoping as well, that the the impact, the size of this bomb would convince the Japanese to surrender, but they don't. Again, that Bushido code. So the Americans dropped the second bomb over Nagasaki. Now you can see here, here's an aerial photograph before the bomb and below is after. It just wipes out this community and it was a calculated risk. The Allies knew that there would be heavy losses. They had targeted economic centers rather than population centers. Um, but there was quite a heavy loss of life. But the alternative was to continue fighting to the death. After the second bomb is dropped, the Japanese decide that they do want to surrender. So here in the Western Hemisphere, it was August 14th. And in the Japanese time zone, it was August 15th. So we have victory in Japan. So finally, this war is over. Just such relief, such rejoicing. We have the very famous photograph in Times Square. Here is the body count. Nearly 60 million people killed as a result of this war. This was definitely a world war in terms of the territories where it was fought. The countries represented the people who were killed. This war really demonstrates the power of modern science, either for good or for evil. So why did we win? First of all, the Allies were able to produce more. This is both from the Soviet Union and the United States. We have the Americans who start producing in the 1930s who are uh, selling and then lending products to Britain. And that's possible because America's not involved in war, so they can be producing things. And then as a result of Stalin's five-year plans, that this massive production gave the Allies more supplies. Then we have the entry of the U.S. as of December 7, 1941. Um, the British had been fighting for two years by that point, and they needed more help, more than just economic or supplies. They needed manpower, and the Americans provide that. Now, that's not to say that you should tell someone who is British, you're welcome. I would not suggest that. Um, while our entry in the war was a very important element, we cannot forget the work that had been done by the British, that their country had been under attack constantly for years, and the sacrifices that the British people made. 
we also have all of the weapons that are developed or improved upon. The, the use of radar, which will be important from here on out. The way planes were adapted, either for uh, dogfighting or for bombing. All of these different variations. And then, of course, the atomic weapons. As this war is coming to a close, the Allies need to decide what will happen next. So the first major instance of this is at Yalta. It's a Crimean resort town. And we have Britain, America, and the Soviet Union represented. So Churchill, President Roosevelt, and Stalin. One of the biggest things they decide is what to do with Germany. By February 45, it was very clear that Germany would lose. It was just a matter of time. Now, they could take a page from the Treaty of Versailles and take away territory, force them to pay reparations, punish them. But as they saw, that did not work and that caused war. So Germany is allowed to stay Germany. Germany keeps its borders and it will just be occupied and sort of babysat by these allied nations. So here we can see the territories. And still in that pink, this area that will be controlled by the US, we still have a number of American air bases and military outposts. The other issue is that um, the British and Americans asked Stalin, if the war lasts much longer, would Stalin get involved in the Pacific? Stalin absolutely did not want to. He felt that he had done his part he had disabled the Germans enough in the Eastern Front in the Battle of Stalingrad that he didn't need to sacrifice anymore. Then, once the war in Europe is done, they need to come up with a few more specifics. So they do that at Potsdam, which is just outside of Berlin. Same countries, but different people. We'll start with America. Um, President Franklin Roosevelt had died. He had been ill for quite some time. And so his vice president, Harry Truman, takes over. You can see we still have Stalin. And then we have Clement Attlee, the new British prime minister. When the war was over, Britain holds elections, as they hadn't for so long because of the war. Churchill, the man who had led the British people through the war, through a few harsh policies, rationing um, sort of that sense of the stiff, stiff upper lip that the British have. He looked to a future after the war where the people would pull themselves up by the bootstraps. The British people were exhausted and they wanted more help from the government. They wanted more services provided. And that's what Clement Attlee's party offered. So the man who led Britain through the war is not reelected and Clement Attlee takes his place. The biggest thing decided at Berlin, uh, sorry, at um, the Potsdam Conference is what to do with Berlin. We've talked about the capital cities being very symbolic. Berlin is in the heart of the Soviet-controlled part of Germany, but they decide to divide the city itself just because it is so symbolic. And we see here East and West Berlin. All of this will lead to some of our topics in the Cold War. The other major thing is uh, Stalin is rewarded with Eastern Europe. Remember, he argued that his disabling of Germany at Stalingrad and on the Eastern Front was so significant that the Allies would not have won the war without Stalin's efforts. And his consolation prize, his goodie bag, is this territory. Now we look at all of this, these territories that had been controlled and conquered by the Nazis, now conquered and controlled by another dictator. Now why would the Allies do this? Why would they, why would they agree to this? Well, even though Russia, Britain, and America were allies, they were truly frenemies. Britain and America had no love for Stalin, but at the time, they all had a common enemy in Hitler. Now that Germany has been eliminated, there is tension between the Soviet Union and the West. So rather than fight each other, they agree to this compromise, and it will take us directly into the Cold War.